Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to the last day here at KubeCon. Um, we've got some exciting, uh, I'm Aaron Reinhardt. Uh, this is Matas. Uh, we have uh, an exciting talk to, to, to bring to you. And um, today we're going to talk about um, a new open source tool. It's an exciting announcement. We actually chose KubeCon uh, in particular to announce the tool. The tool was written some time ago, but we, we chose uh, uh, KubeCon to actually debut and announce the, the first ever open source uh, tool for security chaos engineering, uh, and we're gonna so let's dig in. Let's dig into it. Yeah, and just uh, some of you might be confused because in the schedule it said Comrade. It was previously named to the uh, Comrade Dyatlov, who chaos engineered the Chernobyl plant um, due to the recent events in Ukraine. Uh, I decided to change the name to Kirovus. So it's the same thing, just just a different name. So, uh, like I said, I'm Aaron Reinhardt. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Berica.io. Um, I'm also known as being the sort of the creator, the person behind security chaos engineering. I wrote the first open source tool in the space uh, about five years ago. I'm also uh, the uh, co-author with Kelly Shortridge on the O'Reilly books on the topic. If anyone is interested in getting a copy of the O'Reilly book, please see me after the talk, and I'd be happy to get you a copy of it. Yeah, I'm Matas. I'm currently a software engineer at CastTI. Uh, the project I'm present, well, we're presenting it has been started during my master's studies in Technical University of Denmark. My supervisor, Jose Soler. Like I said, there are several books on. Uh, so I'm going to talk about several topics today, but in particular, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go over what chaos engineering is, just to give you a basis of what that is. Um, uh, also, uh, but there are several there are several O'Reilly books that you can download and get, get dive deeper in chaos engineering and security chaos engineering. Uh, Matas, so this tool, uh, Curvis, will be documented in the, the animal book that comes out later this year. Uh, so uh, we'll stay tuned for that as well. So, um, so, uh, so what are we going to talk about this? So today we're going to talk about um, the nature of complexity in modern software. We're going to talk about chaos engineering. We're going to talk about its application to security. We're going to talk about use cases, uh, and um, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to give a demo of of Carvis, as well as uh, how to get started and how to start applying uh, these concepts um, when, when you get back to you know, back home. So in this session, uh, we're going to cover a lot of material very quickly. So like I said before, there are O'Reilly books, there are lots of uh, blogs and articles online. You, uh, I have my contact information. I'll, I'll share or, or come up to me after the talk, and I'd be happy to, to connect with you and help you learn more. Um, so the crux of what we're addressing here is that in the world of cybersecurity, uh, even modern engineering, when it comes to outages, breaches, and incidents, you know, no matter how, how, how sophisticated we seem to be getting, we're, we don't seem to be getting a lot better at preventing them. Or, 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 or um, it seems that outages and incidents are happening more and more often. We're going to talk about why I think that is. And why is this? I mean, what, are we doing something wrong? Well, um, not necessarily. We're doing lots of things right. Well, the problem is, is that our systems have fundamentally evolved beyond our human ability to mentally model their behavior. It's, it's hard for humans to simplify and abstract hundreds of thousands of things, um, and uh, it's very difficult in, 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 in today's modern computing environment. It's, it's, uh, what makes this difficult uh, is that the speed, scale, and complexity uh, of modern software is, is challenging. And so if you've ever seen this picture on the left here, this is actually um, a, uh, a microservice architecture. Every little dot is a service, and uh, they're all connected. Uh, they're connected. Um, these are, this is what our computing systems look like now. Right? So we're no longer living the, the era of the three-tier app. Uh, it's very difficult to understand what's going on at any given point in time within a system. So where does all this complexity come from? So you see, you see things on here that are things we're trying to adopt, things we're trying to do, DevOps. CI/CD, Auto Canary, Circuit Breakers, Service Meshes, right? These are all these are all great things, right? Well, so um, the nature of software is software never decreases in complexity. You can't actually decrease it. If you have a complex piece of software and you want to make it simple, you have to change it to do so. There's an inherent relationship between making a change and introducing additional complexity. So really, we're going to talk. I'm going to dive deeper into what that means in terms of uh, of, of, of um, our modern systems here in a second. So uh, f furthermore, uh, so on the right here, you see the new OSI stack. It's software, 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 right? Uh, 
the software is officially taking over. Newsflash, if you're at a software conference. Uh, and you know, this, is the, this, this has brought lots of advantages, but also it's brought a new era of complexity uh, that we have to manage as operators. So um, like I said, software only ever increases in complexity. It doesn't decrease complexity. So there's a paper written in 1985 called No Silver Bullet. It's, it's, it's about the nature of where complexity comes from in software. There are two different schools of thought. There's accidental complexity and essential complexity. So essential complexity comes from things like Conway's Law, where organizations are destined to design computer systems that reflect the way they operate as a business. What, I, what that means is, is that you can't actually change the complexity in, without changing the business. You inherited that and that found its way into software, right? So you have to change the business to actually change that complexity. Accidental complexity comes from the ways in which we build software. Uh, and, uh, but really, you know, um, you can't actually remove complexity in software. Uh, like, like I said, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not necessarily about trying to make this more simple. It's trying to um, drive further context and navigate the complexity. So like I said, so chaos engineering, what we're talking about, is not, not breaking things in production. Uh, by the way, don't do that. You'll get fired, right? Uh, this is, um, uh, don't tell your boss if you want to do that. It, it's about we're trying to proactively fix things. Uh, and we're, um, and part, part of the ability to do that is navigating the inherent complexity. Okay, so um, when we design systems, uh, as engineers, as human beings, we, we, um, we forget the, how messy systems engineering really is. Because um, I used to be the chief security architect at United Health Group, the, lar the largest healthcare company in the world. And pe I'd have a data architect uh, and a solutions architect come to me for the same uh, system, uh, and they have two different diagrams, right? Uh, but that's, the data architect had a different mental model of what they believed the system was. So the solutions architect, right? Well, neither one of them are wrong, they're both right, but they're more right when you overlay them together. Does that make sense? So it's, it's we, um, so in the beginning of designing a system, right? So we, the plan is so simple, so clear. We have, you know, we've got our resources, we kind of know the timeline. We've got our, our repo, you know, we've got our Docker images, we've got staging prod, you know, and we always, we have that nice 3D diagram of the system, right? Well, in reality, the system almost never ever looks like this, right? So what happens is, within, within a few days, within a few months, we start learning about the difference between what we thought the system was and what it actually is. And we learn that through a series of outages and incidents, surprise events. And, I mean, uh, so after, after a day, you know, uh, marketing comes down and says, uh, we got the pricing model wrong, we have to refactor. Or we, uh, there's an expired cert, because we forgot to change it or update it, right? Or, you know, um, uh, we sold, we, uh, Sydney Decker, one of the world's experts in safety engineering, uh, in the world of resilience engineering, which is where all this stuff comes from, uh, is, uh, likes to call this the slow drift into failure, right? Is our system slowly evolves to a state where we no longer recognize it. So in the end, the point of behind all this is our systems have fundamentally become more complex and messy than we remember them being. So what does all this stuff have to do with security, right? Well, I'm, I'm getting, I'm building, I'm building. We're building suspense, we're getting there. So, <clears throat> uh, cybersecurity is a context-dependent discipline, okay? So, um, so I was a software engineer for most of my career before I got into cybersecurity. And um, as an engineer, you know, you need the flexibility and convenience to change something. You're not sure, one, you're not sure if you can actually do what you're being asked to do. So you're, it's a process of trial and error. You're trying to figure it out. Uh, you don't know what permissions you need or what ports you need open. You don't know those things, right? Um, so you kind of need the flexibility to make changes. Because the software engineer, your, your job is to deliver value to customer via product, via software, right? But your con your con software engineers are constantly changing the environment. They're constantly trying to achieve business value, right? Well, security is context dependent. You must know what you're trying to secure in order to know what needs to be secured about it, right? You have to, I mean, you have to know that first, right? Well, um, so what that, the problem with that is is that we go forth and we often build based on a context at a state and time. We build that. Like we built, we deploy a runtime security tool or uh, configuration rules. We do that based on that context. What, happened, what happens is, is that engineers never stopped changing the system. They're still moving towards business value. 
at that point in time, we built the secure, we built the security based on the context we understood, but the drift is occurring, if that makes sense. So with chaos engineering for security, we're introducing the conditions by which we expect the security to function. So we know proactively that, oh, oh my gosh, my security doesn't actually work the way I thought it did, or it no longer is effective at doing what I designed it to do. We learned that before an adversary can take advantage of a fundamental issue, a bit of visibility. So in terms of chaos engineering, so I like to I like kind of break down uh, in the term world of instrumentation testing. You know, uh, what I love about chaos engineering in particular is that, um, you know, it's fundamental science and engineering. All science and engineering revolves around testing, instru instruments, instrumentation, data, measurement, uh, and that's what we're trying to achieve here. But in terms of what we do in software, so uh, there's a little bit of a difference between testing and experimentation. And experimentation is really where the chaos engineering fits in. So testing, well testing, we're trying to verify or validate something we already know to be true or false. It's sort of a binary thing. In the world of security, so it's what we, uh, we know what we're looking for before we go looking for it. So the world of security, that's things like um, C a CVE, an attack pattern, and a signature. Um, whereas uh, experimentation and chaos engineering, we're trying to derive new information that we pre previously did not know, the, more the unknown space of the system. And we do that by introducing the conditions we expect the system to successfully operate under. We never introduce chaos engineering to introduce chaos. Chaos engineering is not about chaos, creating chaos. It's actually about creating order. And I'm going I'm to I'm expand on that in a minute. So chaos engineering. So the original Netflix definition is uh, the discipline of experimentation on distributed systems in order to build confidence in your ability to withstand turbulent conditions. So our, another way of saying this is it's the practice of proactively introducing um, uh, the uh, failure into a system to try to determine the conditions by which the system will fail before it fails. We're, this is a proactive discipline. We're trying to understand and verify and validate and build confidence that the system can actually handle 140 milliseconds of latency. Can actually, uh, we can actually detect when a misconfigured port, a misconfigured user uh, entitlement, we, we can detect those things proactively instead of finding out after the fact when somebody exploits that, going backwards is, is, uh, um, is, is much, much more difficult and much more painful for the, for the world, for uh, the consumer. So uh, chaos engineering uh, began, uh, how many people here have heard of Chaos Monkey? Probably the majority, right? I, I figured so. Uh, so that <clears throat> chaos engineering was sort of the genesis of, of, um, of uh, I mean, Chaos Monkey was sort of the genesis of chaos engineering at Netflix. And so uh, what I want to do is kind of maybe tell some things you maybe not know, do not know about Chaos Monkey. Um, so Chaos Monkey uh, was uh, sort of came about about 2008, 2009 at Netflix. So Netflix was moving during their cloud transformation. Remember, Netflix wasn't always in the cloud. During their cloud transformation to AWS, what was happening was is AMIs, Amazon Machine Images, just were poof, just disappearing. There's no explanation why. It was, it was a feature, right? Well, um, Netflix was trying to build a very large streaming streaming service. You know, customers are not going to like it if the service goes down when they're trying to consume it. So what they did was is um, they went forth and they built their systems. They said, okay, we're going to build our systems to be resilient to this problem. Um, so when they did that, they needed a way to actually verify that that logic. So, so if you think about things like retries, circuit breakers, security detective and preventative kind of things, or failovers, um, that we designed that logic at a point in time uh, uh, to operate under certain conditions. So, uh, um, so uh, when X happens, Y will be triggered, right? What happens is, remember, engineers are constantly changing the system, and we almost never actually exercise that code path until the problem occurs. Well, engineers have been changing the system a lot, that, system, that may not actually still do what you need to do. Uh, so with Chaos Monkey, well, Netflix was able to introduce the conditions and ensure that, that uh, their failovers and circuit breaker patterns could actually, uh, actually could do what they needed it to do. So Chaos Monkey, uh, how it operates, if you're not familiar, um, it's, like I said, it was born during uh, Netflix's cloud transformation. Um, but um, it, uh, it, it, what, it's, what it does is, so pseudo-randomly during business hours, it will terminate an AMI. Uh, and it does that so engineers um, can, like I said, validate that their, uh, the log their logic actually uh, functions. So 
uh, Casey Rosenthal, my co-founder and also the creator of Chaos Engineering at Netflix, uh, likes to say that, um, you know, be very careful about breaking things on purpose. We're not trying to do that. Do not leave here today in, with the concept of breaking things. That is not what we're doing, right? We're proactively fixing them. Um, it's about, like I said, it's about continuously verifying the system and creating order. And yeah, and, and I'm pretty sure, Casey, Casey loves to tell people this, I'm pretty sure that when I'm breaking things, I probably won't have a job for very long. Oh. So who's doing chaos engineering? So many companies, I can't even, I can't even count anymore. Right? I mean, everyone, I mean, people are at various stages of maturity. People are, are, are adopting the concepts and implementing tools and, and practices. Uh, but this is becoming more and more of a, a standard practice. In, uh, in the future, you really have no choice. We have, uh, because our systems have become so large and they're changing so fast, we need a way to instrument the system post-deployment. This chaos engineering is not a build process testing or instrumentation. It's the post-deployment world that we're trying to instrument and validate. So security chaos engineering. Newsflash, it's not a lot different. It's the same thing as chaos engineering. So how, the point is we're trying to verify that, um, we, uh, um, that our security actually works. So hope, uh, as an engineer, I don't believe in two concepts as an engineer. I don't believe in hope or luck, right? Uh, and hope has never been an effective strategy. I mean, it works in Star Wars, but it doesn't really work in engineering. We believe in data, measurement, and, and instrumentation. Um, uh, and so what we're trying to do with the, like I said before, is the, with security chaos engineering, is we're trying to proactively understand where our gaps are in our security before an adversary can take advantage of the fact we just don't see it. So um, some use cases, in the O'Reilly books, there's a, it's, it's much deeper. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, several, there's actually a couple more use cases in the books. Uh, you're more than happy to, uh, to, to dive deep into it, but I started applying chaos engineering for security uh, in the world of sort of architecture and validating uh, security mechanisms. Because what was happening is, is engineers would come to me and architects would come to me to be, for, for guidance, for help, and I, would, I love what I do. Right, and I would try to give them the best guidance possible, but I was never sure if um, they uh, understood me correctly, or if if the if they actually configured it correctly, if they placed it correctly, because engineering is a very opinionated and specific discipline. Uh, and what I needed was a way to ask the computer questions, uh, and that's uh, that, so that's that's where I started. So uh, chaos engineering for security and chaos engineering in general is great for um, uh, instant response. Uh, for uh, actually uh, identifying um, uh, you know, uh, gaps in your observability, uh, um, and as well as every chaos experiment, whether it's security or it's availability based, they all have compliance value, if you think about it, right? So um, you're basically proving whether the technology worked the way you said it did. Uh, so make sure you keep your, uh, your output of your experiments in, um, you know, and, because that can be used for, as an audible artifact. How does it work? So we're going to get to that. That's what uh, he's going to talk about. Um, but uh, uh, I started uh, at United Health Group by writing a tool. You can actually go to the GitHub repo still. It's somewhat deprecated. I'm not there anymore. I've been there for a long time. They wrote a different tool that they use. Um, but, to this, uh, but you can still go to the repo and kind of see how experiments are written. It's written in Python and Lambda in AWS. Um, but uh, I'll give you a quick example real quick here. Uh, so, so you kind of get the concept of how it is, how it's applied, and what we're trying to achieve and do. Um, so when we open source Chaos Slayer, uh, we need an example that a security engineer, that um, a network engineer, a software engineer, that executive, that people could generally understand. Well, we've been, we've been solving for misconfigured port changes for like 35 years, right? Uh, but some odd reason it still happens, right? It's not because... Um, uh, it's, it's not because uh, anybody intentionally did something wrong or malicious. Mistakes happen. Some, in, in, uh, if you're not a network engineer, flow, network flow is not a very intuitive thing, actually. Uh, and um, it, it happens. So people make mistakes, right? Well, um, so at, when I was at United, States United Health Group, this was a problem we thought we had 100% solved. Is that this is something we, we, we felt so confident that if this occurred, we would detect it, we prevent it, we stop it, and we had, uh, you know, there's, and we had it covered. Well, so so uh, when we so this so the example, main example in the repo for Chaos Singer is this tool called this uh, this uh, misconfigured port um, uh, injection, and um, 
So we started doing this on all of our AWS instances at uh, United Health Group. And what was happening was about 60% of the time, uh, the firewall actually caught it. But there's 40% of the time it didn't. Uh, that was not something we expected. We were very new to the cloud, new to AWS at the time. Uh, and, um, you know, but what we found out was, remember, this was proactive. There was no outage. There was no incident. There was no breach. We proactively realized, oh my gosh, this doesn't really work. Uh, and so we, um, uh, you know, so there, what we found out was there's a drift issue between our commercial software and our non-commercial software firewall instances. So no problem. We proactively found it and we fixed it before there was pain. Um, so that was the first thing we learned. The second thing we learned was that our cloud native configuration management tool caught and blocked the change 100% of the time. Something we didn't even think about was actually better, more effective than, than uh, what we expected. That was the second thing. The third thing was is that um, we, uh, we, we built our own sort of security observability tool with a big, massive data lake. And I wasn't, uh, because we're new to the cloud, I wasn't expecting an alert to actually fire from the, these, uh, these events. Uh, but that actually happened. So we validated the alerting actually worked. But uh, finally, what, what happened is, is that when the analyst, the instant responder, got the alert, they couldn't tell which Amazon it came from. Uh, now, as an engineer, you're saying, Aaron, you can map back an IP address and figure out where it came from. Yeah, you, you can, right? But during incident or an outage, that can take 15 minutes, 30 minutes. If SNAT is part of it, uh, um, you could be maybe an hour. And uh, in that case, um, you know, uh, when I was at you know, the health group, about one, um, during the busiest time of year, one minute of downtime was over a million dollars for one minute. All that, so all that pain never has to occur. If we proactively um, verify the system is doing what we expect. So I'm going to turn it over to Matas. He's going to talk about uh, um, Curvis. Yep. So the Curvis I mentioned previously, it's an open source tool. Um, it's a security chaos engineering tool for Kubernetes. And uh, what am I specifically talking about? So the low-hanging fruit targets are CIS benchmark uh, benchmarks for uh, Kubernetes. Um, for example, API server configurations, master and worker nodes. Uh, there's also kubelet uh, configuration and parameters which are relevant for security. Networking is always interesting. Uh, we're going to talk, be talking about core DNS and DNS spoofing. And there's also a lot of more everything you can think of. I've experimented with penetration testing uh, experiments, uh, crypto mining pods. Uh, they didn't make the demo, but uh, someone would be probably interested in them. So what is an experiment exactly? So when we're talking about API server, uh, let's say there is uh, authorization mode parameters. And it's only relevant for uh, those who use self-managed Kubernetes. Um, but for example, there is this um, small parameter called RBAC. Do you know what would happen to your uh, cluster if you removed it? Um, you're welcome to try with my tool. Also, you can do the same with uh, each kubelet in your cluster. Um, fortunately, there was this dynamic kubelet configuration uh, feature. Apparently, I was the only user, so with one, two, four, they deprecated and removed it. But we're still going to be demoing it. Maybe it's useful to someone. And how does the experiment look like? Um, so you choose an experiment, something you want to test, something you're sure that uh, is not something you're secure about. Then you choose the experiment. You, uh, what the pod does is backups your previous configuration for the parameter or configuration you're testing, if it's applicable. It then applies its payload that uh, changes the existing configuration. Then it tries to validate. Did, the, did it apply? If it did, it enters ready state and uh, then you're free, you're free to verify, am I seeing what's happening? Um, when you decide you've had enough, you restore the previously backed up configuration, and you, you go on as you did before. So the, the demo. Uh, so first off, we're going to start with uh, CIS benchmark um, worker uh, experiments. And they're good to see like how it works in practice. So for example, we choose the uh, benchmark 415. It, uh, it's related to the uh, access rights to one of the files on, on your worker nodes. So I previously ran Kubebench, and if you noticed, uh, it passed. Like everything's fine. 
then we apply one of the experiment, well, we apply the experiment pod with the parameter 415. I want to misconfigure, I want to test that. So, uh, you can see that the pod enters ready state, it's called, the, yeah, the chaos pod, and it reports that uh, I'm cur currently misconfiguring uh, CIS 415. Uh, we run kubench again, kubench backwards query, and uh, in the logs we can check again, and uh, 415 will be invalidated. So, you know, you can, you see that uh, it's actually doing its job, it's, uh, it's not passing uh, for everything. Um, then we can uh, terminate the experiment pod and it will restore the previously backed up uh, file permissions and uh, it will pass again. So the nice thing about that is, uh, you know, well, of course there's always risks. I mean, something, uh, you know, the electricity going down during the middle of the experiment, but uh, yeah, you don't have to back it up yourself and that's the nice thing. You can see the experiment were back to the initial state uh, regarding the parameter 415. The next, next experiment, it's uh, relevant for Kube API server, and uh, we're gonna, it's again part of CIS benchmark configurations. It's uh, regarding the anonymous authentication parameter, but uh, yeah, you can work, well, uh, the tool Kervis uh, can work with any parameter when setting, updating, removing existing parameters. My personal favorite yeah, is authorization modes. Um, in this case, we're just using anonymous authentication and we create a pod that uh, misconfigures the API server. It takes a while because the API server has to uh, restart and yeah, as mentioned, it's only relevant for self-managed Kubernetes. But uh, yeah, you can see in the logs, um, it's applying one to one. Then we, it uh, validates itself by checking the process, process running on the um, master node and seeing whether you know the misconfigured parameters are what we're experimenting with and uh, yeah that's how it can, it can confirm that it's not just uh, doing some random thing you can also see in the manifest that anonymous authentication has been added and as with uh, the previous experiments after we delete the pod it uh, it, back, it uh, restores the API server configuration from backup and you're back to square one. Okay, yeah, the API server is, uh, can be validated both by reading the manifest or checking the command line argument, the, argu the process arguments, and that's what we, that's what we do in this case, the anonymous authentication is no longer there. So the next experiment, it will be relevant for the uh, for kubelet parameters with the feature, the dynamic kubelet uh, configuration feature that I mentioned. Um, so as we can see, I chose a parameter called event record QPS. It's a easily quantifiable value. It's easy to see like the changes in here. And we're querying the kubelet uh, configuration for uh, for its uh, yeah for its parameters. We can see that event record QPS it's set to five right now. We're just uh, choosing this parameter and applying a kubelet misconfiguration experiment with it. With it. After a while, kubelet uh, misconfiguration, when it starts running, it also takes a while because it has to, it, the kubelet has to restart and use the new configuration. But, uh, yeah. When it uh, can verify that it's been applied, it uh, starts reporting that the event record QPS experiment is running. Uh, we can verify manually that it has been changed. Now what you would do is you would, uh, if this is something that you want to be aware of continuously, you would go check your, um, your observability stack, whether you know, someone's changing the configuration, can I see that it's, uh, of course, I don't record QPS, maybe it's not something a hacker would do, but as a POC, it, uh, it is an interesting to test. When we revert to experiment, yeah, it again, it takes a while until the kubelet restarts and uh, it uses the old value. Uh, the next experiment, it's uh, relevant for core DNS. Um, we, what we do is uh, uh, core DNS spoofing or we just add the new domain name to the core file in the core DNS config map and uh, in one of the pods in the cluster, I'm trying to 
curl for Google. It's uh, the HTTP version, so it's, uh, we get re uh, the result that we want. We then apply a query in this uh, configuration experiment. I've configured it to so that uh, all queries to Google go to yahoo.com. And uh, once uh, once the pod enters the ready state, it takes a while. Query in is uh, it's, uh, it takes a while until it picks up on the configuration. Sometimes you can have to uh, roll out the new pod. So for POC experiment, that's what we're doing. And as you can see, the experiment is applied. And once we go into the the previously pod, we receive a different response. So it might be interesting to someone who's like who want to verify that the, any changes in the core file, they there will be a error. That I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't take much for something bad to happen. When we delete again, like like with the others, we revert to initial state. Takes a while. That's uh, that's why we're not doing a live demo. And uh, yeah, we can confirm that we can yeah return to previous state. The the last experiment that I'm going to demo, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's relevant to DNS spoofing. Um, also, thanks to Nir Chaco from CyberArk, he's been uh, yeah, how do I turn the audio for this? Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, it's uh, like I've used the POC that he wrote on on his blog. It's uh, about DNS spoofing and networks with uh, L2 bridges, and basically what we do is. Uh, uh, it's ARP spoofing plus DNS spoofing on pods. So we have a regular pod who, yeah, who, who's communicating some service. We then apply a spoofer pod who uh, ARP spoofs both, uh, both the nodes uh, bridge and the pod. And uh, yeah, when, the, when the experiment is applied, we'll be able to see yeah, it's, it's running. Yeah, so again, I've chosen Google.com, uh, the HTTP version. The, and uh, previously, we received a response from Google.com. Now that we've applied the experiment, we received some malicious payload, uh, which is uh, yeah, also the DNS uh, lookup resolves to the spoofing pod. Again, it's uh, it works only on um, in this case, we use a, I'm, I'm using a flannel CNI, so it's uh, probably not relevant for everyone, but uh, anyone who uses that and wants to experiment, uh, feel free. Once we delete the pod, as always, in this case, we didn't, uh, what we did was uh, we backed up the t ARP table, and it takes a while until it gets restored, so it's a different kind of backup, but uh, once we uh, get to the, once we finish termination, we're returned to the initial state and we can uh, resolve Google.com as intended previously. And yeah, that's all of the experiments that I want to show. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I guess we're open up the Q&A. Do we have time for Q&A? I think there's a microphone here too, if somebody Wants to ask a question? Uh, here's some example questions we get a lot, so feel free to. Any questions? No questions? It's Friday, right? <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, Matas and I will be here after. If anybody has any questions, they want to come up and chat and talk, and um, we're happy to, to share. But thank you all for having us. Thank you. Thank you.